tonight. Take your songbook. Turn to page 413. 413. Let's all stand as we sing. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. Sing it out on this good song. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this opportunity to be in church again tonight. Lord, we sure are appreciative of your many blessings. Lord, I'm thankful for the good service this morning. Lord, the folks that were here. Lord, I just uh, thank you, Lord, for blessing. Lord, for using us. And Lord, just taking care of us in spite of our many faults and failures. Lord, tonight I pray that you'd be lifted up again in all that we say and do through the singing especially, Lord, through the preaching. Lord, we'll be careful to give you the praise for all that you have done that are going to do tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Keep your songbook. And uh, let's turn backwards to page 410. The faith is the victory. Yeah, that's the key to the Christian life. Amen. Living by faith. Let's sing that song tonight. 410, faith is the victory. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies against the foe in veils below. Let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory. With shouts of triumph trod By faith they like a whirlwind's breath Swept on o'er every field The faith by which they conquered death Is still our shining shield Faith is the victory Faith is the victory To him that overcomes the foe, why 
white raiment shall be given before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven then onward from the hills of light our hearts will love a flame will vanquish all the host of night in jesus conquering name faith is a victory faith is a victory give you a couple of announcements and reminders uh, tonight and uh, and a couple of prayer requests. Then young people, be ready with your Bible verses here in just a second. All right, let me mention these prayer requests. I want us to continue to pray for uh, Nahum O'Brien, who we mentioned this morning, and he is battling cancer, uh, colon cancer. So let's keep in our prayers as they go this week to get some more answers and uh, really just pray that the Lord give them wisdom as to what the best road ahead is. For those that may not remember uh, who Brother Nahum is, he married one of the Martin girls uh, by Columbia. Of course, my brother is married to a Martin girl, and so that's the connection we have. But their family has been connected with this church for many years. And so please, please pray for him And that's a difficult thing, just in your early 30s and have to face this. So pray for them. And then, if you will, pray for uh, Matt Kelly as he continues to uh, make good improvements. And um, did they, did he get to eat this week? Did I see that? So everything is completely out. No more feeding tubes, uh, nothing at all. First time since way back in the fall, I think September. And so we're just praising the Lord for that. And then if you would, pray for our spring program. It begins this week, and I know that every Sunday should be an exciting Sunday, right? We should work for every single service. But there's just something about having extra promotions, extra things uh, to motivate us and uh, things to work forward, to work towards and things to look forward to. So let's pray about the spring program, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Yes, ma'am. Okay, pray for Bonnie Whitehurst. She fell and broke her hip. All right, let's do pray for her. Okay, here's a few announcements of things coming up. Uh, We'll have a quick teachers meeting after church tonight. So Sunday school teachers will just meet over in, um, let's just meet in the ladies' classroom after church. It won't take very long at all. I want to just remind you about Wednesday midweek service, 7 o'clock. Young people are here for Patch Club, and then we're, we're in our Bible study in the book of John right now, and we're looking forward to each Wednesday night. That'll be uh, actually not this Wednesday, though. Uh, I won't be here. I forgot, almost forgot about that. And so uh, there is no Patch Club Wednesday night, but there will be church uh, just as normal. Brother Carroll will be preaching. So you be here. We'll be up at my family's for my parents' 50th wedding anniversary celebration and most all of us kids will be in church together Wednesday night so we look forward to being together there and then the anniversary party is on Thursday so that's about this week uh, next Sunday harvest Sunday so the first Sunday of our spring program and I challenge the church this morning I hope that you'll do it uh, you know you, you might not feel up to the challenge but hey uh, this is our church right it's amazing how uh, we like to uh, we like to claim things when we really didn't work toward that. There's a message maybe I'll preach uh, sometime and um, called spiritual welfare. Spiritual welfare. It's amazing how many folks, not our church of course, right, uh, are on spiritual welfare. You say, what is that? Well, you claim all the benefits while, while somebody else is putting in all the work. Right, And we say, hey, this is my church. We had so, uh, so many in church Sunday. We had this and this. Well, how much work did you put into it? Amen. And so spring program is an extra push for everybody to get excited and to be involved. So 
Harvest Sunday next week, and uh, we're just making it simple. Each one reach one. And the challenge is this week, uh, if you'll pray about it and the Lord will lead you, uh, you can pass out a track every single day to somebody, some person, or put a track in the mail to somebody. But try to get a track out this week every day. And then you pray about you personally uh, being able to bring somebody to church next week. At least invite one person to church. They may not come, but you never know, they might. It's amazing how the Lord works. You invite somebody and they might not come, but somebody else does and that you had no clue would come. And that's just how the Lord does things. So next Sunday, we look forward to a good day. And of course, the theme will be about reaching the harvest. And we'll be motivated, I think, by the music and by the preaching next week. So we look forward to that. And um, there's just a few other things in the bulletin to, to note. The uh, Ladies Fellowship... April 9th, I think you know what to do there, so make sure you're signing up for those things. Easter Sunday on the 17th, uh, same thing, sign up for those uh, things on the back for the breakfast, and look forward to those things. All right, let's uh, have the young people come. While they're coming, I do want to mention we've been praying for Souls Harbor Baptist Church, and uh, Brother Crutchfield had uh, resigned and retired uh, from pastoring several months ago. And uh, today they have a brand new pastor, uh, Pastor Nathan Keeler, and he's from the St. Louis area. I've had the privilege to meet him at some fellowships, and I believe he's a good man of God. He's a young man, uh, I think just a little bit younger than myself, and got, got a growing family, and uh, he's an exciting guy. So let's pray for their church that they could grow and uh, continue the work of the Lord. That's a blessing for sure. Let's have our scripture verses tonight. So... Like Caden, you're up to bat first. Oh. Word is repay. John three thirty. I must. Good. Good. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin and death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6.23. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin and death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Very good. Thank you, young people. That's a blessing. And I don't think I heard a junior church verse today. All right. Good. How about a little Bible trivia tonight? A little Bible trivia. We've been way off track. And I've got one more section, and then we'll be finished with this Bible trivia. And it's been in the pulpit, and I am... Looking forward to this tonight. All right, so here's a topic of the questions tonight. We'll go through several of these. Uh, these are miracles that happened that took place and the things that the Lord did and uh, to solve these situations. All right, number one, raise your hand if you know the answer, and you'll be entered into a drawing to win $100 tonight. But I have my toes crossed. That's not for real, so... Doesn't count. Okay, here we go. Number one, what was the name of Jairus' daughter who was raised from the dead? Remember uh, Jairus' daughter? Anybody have a clue? Sorry? Well, we don't go multiple choice yet. <laughs> See if anybody knows. Everybody is stumped? Wow, we've got some Bible scholars tonight that are stumped. Do you know Brother Carol? Okay, here we go. Multiple choice. Was it A, Joanna? Was it Tabitha? Was it Susanna? Or was it D, she wasn't named? We're going to go with Ava? Was not. Let's go with Tabitha. She didn't have a name. Very good. 
All right, number two. God provided this to Jonah while he waited to see what would happen to Nineveh. All right, now that, yes. No. Well, uh, yes. It was shade. And uh, let's see what this says particular. This says a vine. But I am thinking about the gourd. That might be all the same. And then the worm came and ate it, and then it died, and then he got mad at the Lord. He was the pouting prophet, wasn't he? Jonah the pouting prophet. Very good. Okay, number three. Sorry? No. Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 26, describes Jesus healing a blind man with this substance. Darren. Very good, that is correct. He spit in the mud, and uh, actually, this might be a different one. There's two occasions. So Mark 8, he heals the blind man with what? It was not mud in this one. Brother Kerry said it. This was just with spit. Jesus yep. used just spit. And uh, what a way to heal somebody, amen? Interesting. Number four. Whose mother-in-law did Jesus heal? Mother-in-law of this person. This was in uh, Matthew chapter 8. Where's the mother in That's correct. Simon Peter's mother-in-law was healed in Mark chapter, Matthew chapter 8. When Elisha restored the son of the Shunammite woman, what was the first thing that the boy did? Remember when he came back to life? was the first thing that he did in 2 Kings chapter 4. Okay, Darren. He sneezed. That was the first thing he did. Then Elisha returned and walked in the house to and fro, went up, stretched himself upon him, and the child sneezed seven times. And uh, interesting as well. Number six, the book of Acts describes how Paul prayed to restore the disciple Dorcas also known as Tabitha, uh, to restore her to life. Is that true or false? The book, let me read it again. The book of Acts describes how Paul prayed to restore the disciple Dorcas, also known as Tabitha, to life. True or false? Dylan. And why do you say that's false? Oh, it's just a guess. Hey, that is false. Why is it false? It was Peter, not Paul. A little bit tricky there. Number seven, Elijah gave instructions for the healing of Naaman, the commander of the army of of Syria from leprosy. This is, again, a true and false question. Elijah gave instructions for the healing of Naaman. True or false? Caleb? False. It is false. Do you know why it's false? Some of you do already. Dawson? Okay. Elisha. It's Elisha, not Elijah. Very good. He was thinking right. Very good. Number eight, when Elijah was taken up to heaven, he left this behind for Elisha. Roger. His mantle. Very good. Second Kings chapter two. All right, we got time for a few more. A Canaanite woman pleaded with Jesus to heal her daughter, even though they weren't Israelites. What was the daughter's affliction? This was a Canaanite lady, and her daughter. What was the daughter's issue? What was wrong? Why did she need healed? Mark chapter 7. Okay, it looks like we're going multiple choice. Was it lameness? Was it internal bleeding? Was it possession by an unclean spirit? Or was it blindness? I'm looking for adults. The kids are just multiple guesses. That's how my school tests were when I didn't study. It was multiple guessing. (laughs) Miss Kelly says, C, that is correct. She had an unclean spirit. I think they're giving each other the answers back and forth up here. 
When Jesus restored the son of the widow of Nain to life, he did so in response to this. So what took place? Why did he see a need for uh, this widow's son to be um, brought back to life? There was something that took place. What, what compelled Jesus or what instigated this healing? Luke chapter 7. All right. Um, was it she found Jesus and pleaded with him? Was it that her friends came on her behalf? Was it he saw the funeral procession and felt compassion for her? Or was it one of the disciples asked if Jesus could help her? Caden? Oh, not the last one. Well, the carol has it. So he actually saw them uh, in the funeral procession, and he said, you know what? Wouldn't that be awesome if Jesus did that today? No, it'd scare me half to death. <laughs> That's what it'd do, right? If a, I mean, right when the funeral's taking place, Jesus said, you know what? Let's just stop this funeral and raise this boy to life. And that's what took place. All right, here's a simple one. Lazarus had been dead how many days when Jesus raised him? How many days? According to John chapter 11, I guess this could be a little bit tricky depending on how you interpret it. But I heard, what'd you say? Four. That's what the answer here says. So he had been in the grave three days, and so this would have been on the fourth day, I guess. Jesus raised him on the fourth day. All right, let's see. I think we'll stop with that tonight. So uh, that was a little bit of fun. A little Bible trivia. So now you know a little bit more of what you didn't know before we started. All right, so let's take our song books. We'll sing another song tonight, and then after this we'll take up our offering. All right, take that hymn and turn to number 243. We saw faith is a victory, so that faith is victory in Jesus.
take up our offering tonight and let's be faithful in our giving here on the last Sunday of the month. Keep your commitments to the missions and, of course, your tithe. Uh, after we pray, the fellas have a special offertory. So uh, you listen to this. Father, thank you for this opportunity to give, to show our love back to you. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity we have for to be in church tonight. Pray that you bless this offertory. May it be uh, just a blessing and help our hearts. And Lord, be with the rest of our service, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bibles, if you will, turn to the book of Numbers tonight, Numbers chapter 13. <clears throat> I don't often do this. As a matter of fact, I really don't remember um, very many times where I'll preach the same message on Sunday night as I did on Sunday morning, but uh, I believe the Lord uh, want, wanted that for tonight. I didn't get quite finished this morning, and uh, that clock just started going really fast toward the end. I ran out of time, but just such a tremendous thought we find here in Scripture, and uh, we'll look at Numbers chapter 13. As soon as I get there, I'm in the wrong place. Numbers 13. We'll look down to verse number 17. If you will, stand as we read just a few verses here. We'll get started tonight again. Numbers chapter 13, verse number 17. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many. And what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, and be ye of good courage, bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. And then if you will, hold your place there and turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1, here's a text verse, verse number 26. Notwithstanding, <laughs> you would not go up, but rebelled 
against the commandment of the Lord your God. And ye murmured in your tents and said, Because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. We're going to finish this thought tonight. Uh, Here's the title, The Delusion of Disobedience. There's a direct correlation between me in my uh, state of disobedience bringing about this delusion in my mind or something that just isn't so. And it's amazing how the Lord, uh, I mean, really just outlines some things in this story of the children of Israel. Because of their disobedience, uh, they were just completely... uh, uh, b- believe this deception that, that Satan had given to him. Notice again, verse 26, they didn't go up, but they rebelled. The very next verse says this, they murmured in their tents and said, because the Lord hated us. Now, God didn't hate them at all, did he? They were completely dis- deceived. Uh, they were had this delusion about them because of Satan. God was very good to them. He wanted them to conquer the land and possess it. We talked this morning how to get to that place of blessing in our life, like the children of Israel were to be, they, they've got to obey God. We've got to obey God. Let's obey Christ and not be deceived in our mind about obedience. And so we'll finish this tonight. Uh, let's pray and I'll have you be seated. Lord, we thank you for the Word of God. Lord, I thank you so much for making these pages come to life. Lord, for giving us understanding. Lord, I believe everything that is written in the Word of God is there for a reason. Lord, I pray tonight that we would be drawn close to you, we'd give it, gain understanding from what we're reading tonight. Lord, I need your help. I pray, Lord, that you would do something in my heart and life tonight, in my mind, Lord, that I could just be used and be that vessel used for you tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. The message is this, the same thought this morning that I shared as we started, when you decide to obey God... Satan will bring a delusion to your mind. He'll cause you to think things that just aren't so. He'll cause you to think things that just aren't true. The word delusion means this, deception. It's a misleading of the mind. And we looked at several things this morning that the children of Israel were just deceived about. Uh, They decided to disobey. And because of that disobedience, there were several things that we find here in Deuteronomy that took place uh, in their life. And, uh, you know, it's just amazing that uh, as a Christian, we can follow the same path that the Israelites did when we decide that, you know, uh, it's really not that important that I obey everything God tells me to do. I can pick and choose. I can have that uh, that buffet type of Christianity. And uh, we like buffets, amen. That, why? Because as a Baptist, you can get your money's worth at a buffet. And we like to go, but, you know, the truth of the matter is, I don't like everything on that buffet. What's one thing you all know I don't like? Brussels sprouts, amen? And you can have all of them. But I think over the last year or two, my wife did fix them, and I ate them, and they were actually okay. I didn't dislike those. That, uh, But anyway, there's some things I don't want to eat, but that can't be the way with the Christian life. That can't be the way with the Word of God. We can't pick and choose. and We find very specifically that the Israelites did not obey what God had specifically told them to do. He told them to go and conquer the land. He didn't tell them to go decide if they should conquer it. He said, no, go and figure out the best way to conquer it. I'll be there to help you through that. And we found in Scripture, I'll not go over all these again tonight, but there's a direct correlation between disobedience and delusion. It always happens, and it happened in the very beginning when Satan deceived Adam and Eve. They disobeyed, and uh, they just really began to uh, go down that path of delusion. And, you know, it's just never went away, has it? All of humankind... Mankind, this race that we live, seems like we're always being deceived by the devil. And uh, there were some delusional things that were in their mind about the timing of what God had set forth. It was the perfect timing for them to go and spy out the land. We saw that in Numbers chapter 13. It was a time of first fruits. Uh, They were delusional about the taste. 
They, they had the fruit there and they tasted of it, but yet they still didn't want it. They were delusional about the truth. God said, I'll provide this for you. He said, I promise you I will give you this land. And uh, we saw this point this morning when we are disobedient, we are deceived about the truth that God has given to us in His Word. When we don't obey God, we're saying the promises of God aren't real to me. When we don't obey, we're saying the, pro the provision of God just isn't good enough for me. And that God doesn't have the power that He says that He did. Let's not ever make up our mind that it doesn't matter what you say or what you show me in Scripture, I'm still not going to do it. You get to that place, you're in a bad place. They were delusional about the threat. We looked at the people that were there and uh, they compared themselves to them. And God said, it's not wise to do that. And uh, he said, I promised already that I'd take care of you. Now, part uh, two or the second part tonight, I want to talk about the relationships that were affected by their disobedience. Uh, some... some uh, Deception that came about in their mind uh, because of their disobedience. Now, their heart of disobedience ev affected every relationship that they had. Every relationship that they had. Now, we're going to go back and forth between Deuteronomy and uh, in Numbers here because these are parallel <coughs> uh, passages of Scripture. But let's first of all go back to Deuteronomy chapter 1. And I want us to see that their heart of disobedience, because they had decided we're not going to do what God said, we're going to rebel against God, how this affected the relationships in their life. Look at chapter 1 and verse number 27. And ye murmured in your tents and said, Because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us. Now, uh, we see very plainly that their relationship with God was affected. You cannot say you have a good relationship with someone if your attitude toward that person is, they hate me, right? Uh, now, we don't like to be hated. I don't like to be hated. I kind of like to have a relationship with folks that people like me, right? And I think you'd say the same thing. I, I can look back on life and, you know, there's different times. There was relationships and people that were in my life that, you know, I feel like they didn't like me a whole lot. There's a, a, a section on my prayer list, and it, the Bible tells us to pray for our enemies. And there's a section on my prayer list for enemies. You say, whose names are on that? Well, I don't list those out because I know in my heart who I think they are. And if somebody ever found my prayer list, I don't want them to see that section of my prayer list. But there's folks that I have to pray for because I think, you know what, I don't think that they like me. I think they have a problem with me. These folks had a problem with God. They said that He hated me. The greatest delusion that resulted from their disobedience was toward God. Now, we need to understand as a Christian, our heart should be right toward God. If you ever get to a place in your life where you really have an attitude toward God that He doesn't love me, that He doesn't have my best interest in mind, that He isn't looking out for me, I hopefully never get to the place where you say, God hates me. But if you get to that place in your life where your attitude toward God is like this, something's not right. I ought to get, get to my prayer closet and say, Lord, what is going on? Why do I have these thoughts toward you? Hey, listen, my thoughts toward God should only be thoughts of, of peace, thoughts of love, thoughts of joy. Why? Because God is good. Uh, he is good at uh, who He is and what He does to me. But their heart was not right toward God, and it was because, I believe, they had a heart that said, I don't want to surrender. I don't want to do God's will. We get to that place in our life where we rebel. And I can remember, you know, as a young person, there was times I didn't want to do what I was supposed to do. I had a rebellious attitude. I had a better way of doing things than my dad did or my mom did. Or I had a better way of doing things 
uh, than my teacher did. And I said, I'm going to do it my way. And can I tell you, when my heart was rebellious, our relationships were affected. I didn't always enjoy being around my dad. Why? So we weren't getting along. I didn't always enjoy being around the preacher when I was that teenager that I shouldn't have been. Why? Because I wasn't doing right. And we could just go on and on and on. Hey, listen, if you aren't enjoying being around God, if you aren't enjoying a relationship with God, we better stop and find out why tonight. What's going on? Why am I not enjoying this? They were delusional about who God was, and they said He hated us. But now, think about it. Did God hate them? The whole reason He was bringing them to the promised land was because He loved them. The whole reason He was bringing them through all the things they went through and providing for them and leading their way and feeding them in the wilderness was to get them to the promised land because He wanted them to be blessed. They were delusional about God's love for them. They were delusional about God's plans for them. Notice what they said, because the Lord hated us, there's His love for them that, that they had completely messed up. And here's the second thing. He hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. They became delusional that God even had a good plan for them. Now, you might not be delusional about God's love for you, but do you, sometimes I get to a place in my life where I say, you know what, I don't even believe God has a good plan for me. Look at my life. It's completely turned upside down. I mean, I've been going through valleys after valleys after valleys. Does God even have a plan for me? Does He even want to bless me? I think God just wants to take me out into the desert and leave me there to die. I'm telling you, we can get that way in our heart and mind if we're not careful. But God had no plan to allow the Amorites to destroy them. God had already promised back in Exodus, we read that this morning, that He was going to deliver them and give them the land. But all because their minds got messed up. They had a different thought about God. It, was a, it affected their relationship with God. Number two, this disobedience, it affected their relationship with the world. With the world, those that were around them. Uh, in verse number 28, they said, Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, The people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the son of the Anakims there. Now, uh, they, they looked about and their disobedience affected the way they saw other people. It affected the way they saw the world. Uh, in Numbers chapter 13, in verse number 31, we read, But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. This was the twelve spies, and they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched under the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so were we in their sight. We talked a little bit about that this morning. But they, they, they had a complete misunderstanding of the people that were even around them. Their relationship with those around them was messed up. You know, God had already said, don't worry about them, I'll take care of them. Uh, he said, you just leave that up to me. You just be obedient. You just go into the land, and I'll help you to conquer that. But I believe because of their disobedience, because of their rebellious heart, they got to this place where they didn't even trust God there. Uh, let's go on and notice number three, that their disobedience affected their relationship with God's man. With God's man. Uh, notice, let's see here, back in Numbers 14. I'm in Deuteronomy. Let me flip back here. Numbers 14. Notice this in verse number 2. And all the children of Israel, and again, there's a little word there that's pretty amazing. It's the word all. And I believe the Bible means what it says. 
all the children of Israel. We could say right here, all of God's people, all of the church, if you will, murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation, all the congregation, said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God that we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Their disobedience affected the relationship with God's man. It affected the relationship, excuse me, in our day and time known as the preacher. All because of their heart, their disobedience. It's amazing to me sometimes as folks will live their life according to their plan, according to their will. And uh, obviously that includes if you're living according to your your will and not God's will, uh, you're living contrary to the Word of God. But it's always amazing to me how when folks aren't living right, the last person they want to see is the preacher, amen? last person they want to talk to is the preacher. Uh, The last person they want to seek advice from is the preacher. It's awful quiet. In my office sometimes, and I, I think, I wonder why. I wonder why folks are afraid to, to come and talk to the preacher or to get advice. Now, uh, the preacher is just a man of God. And it's important to know this, that the preacher is more man than he is God. But he is the man of God. Uh, there is some insight, some spiritual insight and understanding that I believe can be helped by. But the Bible says the children of Israel had a problem with the man of God. Who was the man of God? Moses. Aaron. These were God's leaders. Uh, The Bible says that they murmured against Moses. And they murmured against Aaron. And uh, it was so foolish of them to do so. And they began to put the blame on Moses and Aaron and say, I can't believe that you've led us here now. And uh, you want us to go and take the land. And we're all going to die The foolish conclusion that they made was found in verse number 2. They said, we'd rather just died in Egypt, or we would have rather just died in the wilderness, than to go into this land and be taken captive or be killed, and our wives and our children be killed. They were saying, we don't trust you, Moses. We don't trust you, Aaron. And here's what happened. They forsook God's or they wanted to forsake God's plan for leading his people. God's plan was to use Moses and Aaron to lead his people. And they wanted to say, you know what, we don't like that. They said in verse number 4, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. It's amazing to me how, and sometimes we might get this way in our own attitude, in our own thought process, and for sure we've seen it happen in our lifetime. Folks will get upset with the preacher. They'll get sideways with the man of God, and they'll say, we don't like the way he operates, so we're going to go find somebody that we do like. And we'll go join that church. You know, if that's your mentality and your reasoning for leaving a church and joining another, it won't be long that you'll leave that church as well. I have seen it happen, and I'm convinced in my heart and mind, if you leave a church over personality differences, over... Uh, He does this, and I don't like it. Uh, You're never going to be happy in life. Never will. Uh, There's a right way to leave a church. There's a wrong way. For sure, scriptural uh, differences would, I believe, warrant a reason to find another church. If they have departed from the scriptures, sure, do that. But these folks, they had no reason to go against God's man, but yet they did. They began to murmur. They began to complain. And they said, let's just make our own leader. What a foolish and a dangerous situation to be in as a child of God. So it affected their relationship with God's man. Something else about their disobedience is it affected their relationship with God's people. Notice 
here in verses 6 through 10. And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And if for obvious reasons, they were pretty upset, Joshua and Caleb. These were the two good guys, okay? These were the two spies that came back with a good report. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. So Joshua and Caleb were trying to encourage the children of Israel, saying, hey, listen, quit looking at how big they are. Quit looking at all the things that you're afraid of. And uh, he said, uh, you know, they are bread for us. I I think we can uh, get this terminology from this scripture here. Uh, You ever heard the term, it's a piece of cake? Yeah, I think it comes right there. Uh, Joshua and Caleb said, hey, uh, those giants, that's just bread for us. Hey, that's just a piece of cake for us to wipe them out. Why? Because he said, hey, the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But look what they did. Verse number 10, But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. I mean, listen, these folks wanted to kill him. The people were so mad at Joshua and Caleb, all because of their rebellious heart. All because of their attitude that said, we're going to do things our way, not God's way. When you do things your way and not God's way, it's going to affect the relationship with God's people. I praise the Lord for, you know, for the most part, we're a church that's in harmony. We're a church that's in unity. I praise God. I don't have to run around and fight fires here and fires there. For the most part, folks get along. And uh, we're in this together. We've got one uh, goal in mind, that's to help people and reach the lost. But I'm telling you, you get sideways with God, that can begin to affect folks in the church. And then, of course, it affected even their relationship with their family. Uh, Their mindset was deceived about their family. They said in verse number uh, verse 3, Wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey. Uh, Now they were delusional about their own family. And and they said, if we go into this land, our families are going to die. All the while forgetting the promises of God, saying, I'll protect you. I'll give these giants into your hand. And so their relationship with their family, we can say, was affected Uh, Let's notice in verse number 28, Numbers 14, God's response to their delusion. Here's what God said to them. Say unto them, as truly as I live. Now let's back up to 26 so we get a context of who's speaking. The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. So God is telling Moses, he said, I want you to say to the children of Israel, verse number 28, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. And all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me, Doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. But your little ones which ye said shall be a prey, them will I bring in. And they shall know the land, this is pretty strong words right here, which ye have despised. But as for you... Your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness. And your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. 
after the number of the days in which he searched the land, even forty days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. I'm telling you, God didn't like too much their disobedience. He said, your children that ye didn't trust me with, you thought they were just going to die if you took the land. God said, I'm going to allow them to go into the land 40 years later, and you're not going to get to see it, except Joshua and Caleb. Everyone 20 years and younger were allowed to live. I'm sorry. Everyone 20 years and older would die in the wilderness. So if you were 19 and younger, you would live. And they would wonder one year for every day. Of course, they spent 40 days there. And so they were to wonder for 40 years there in the wilderness. God was trying to teach them a very important lesson. Now, can I close with this thought? If we don't learn to obey God, <clears throat> listen, our life won't be blessed. We'll not get to the land of victory. Sad to say that most of the time, our disobedience will affect the next generation. Now, the disobedience here in this chapter didn't, because I believe God in His mercy and His grace allowed the children to go ahead and come on in. You see, it wasn't their fault. It wasn't their problem. But oftentimes, that's not the case. Our children see. The next generation sees. They'll be lost. They'll be over by the wayside. And in two or three generations to come, folks won't even know what the Word of God is. They'll have no clue what it means to come to Sunday school and church, all because of a time of disobedience in my life. Can I challenge you tonight? Don't be delusioned by the devil about the things that just aren't so. And if God says to do it, just do it. Just trust Him. I believe that when we get to a place of complete obedience and surrender in our life, we'll experience the Canaan land life, the victorious life, for all is well. doesn't mean we won't have battles. Obviously, had they went to the land, they would have had battles, but God was going to deliver them. He promised He would. We're going to have battles in life, but God will deliver us. He'll be with us. And remember, greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. Would you bow your heads tonight? Thank you, Lord, for this truth found in your word. And Lord, I'm thankful that there were two men, Joshua and Caleb, that had a backbone about them, that stood up for truth and right. And that said, I'm not sure what these other men are thinking, these other ten, but I know me and Caleb... We, we know that God wants us to take this land. And Lord, we know that you used Joshua later on to lead your people. Joshua made these statements. He said, if you want to be successful, if you want to prosper, you're going to have to get in the Word of God. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. He said in Joshua 24, choose this day who you're going to serve. Lord, I pray tonight would be a night of decision that we would decide we want with all of our heart and life to obey you, to follow you, to surrender to you. Lord, would you do that tonight? Or would you help us to understand that we need to live a life of surrender so we can experience the victory in the Christian life? Lord, help, I pray, during this time of invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand to your feet tonight as the piano plays a song of invitation? Whatever the Lord has spoke to you about, Let's surrender to that. I don't want my relationship to be affected with God because of my disobedience. But it will be. I'll not be close to Him. I'll think that He doesn't want to bless me. That He's out to hurt me. He's out to harm me. No, God loves you. He's that good master. Uh, he is that potter that will break and mold you. It may not be enjoyable, but He knows what you can become. He knows that you can be a vessel of honor, but it's not going to be easy. I don't want my relationship with the Lord to be affected because of my disobedience. 
let alone the other folks around me, my family, the pastor. You see, all this could simply be avoided if we would just obey. Sometimes I, I'll shake my head and wonder in the life of my family, my children, why can't they just obey? It's really not that hard. J just obey. And I'm reminded that God looks down at me and far too many times he shakes his head and he probably wonders, why don't they just obey? Why don't they just love me enough to obey? Folks are praying tonight. You come, you spend as much time as you need. Let's leave here tonight with a surrendered heart, a new desire to please God this week. And I believe he'll bring us to that place of blessing that he promised.